Let's know. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for Lord, just the blessing of this time, Lord, to be able to gather. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have, Lord, one, one heart, Lord, one mind, one purpose, Lord, that is to seek you, Lord. Father, to draw close to you, Lord. Father, to just be in your presence, Lord. Father, we enter, Lord, into the Holy of Holies, and Lord, we seek audience with you, and you just touch our hearts, Lord. Father, you move through the worship, Lord, you move, you encourage through the word. You take this time and you just bless each and every person here and those that are at home watching. So we thank you for this time. In your precious name, amen.
remind us that Jesus you are very near Lord that every person that has sorrow and care tonight heartache anybody that's feeling lonely Lord God may you be with them tonight here in our gathering watching online at home Lord wherever each person is God that you would be Lord close to them tonight may you, may you just be honored and lifted up here tonight we pray together in Jesus name Amen Amen Thank you, Lord. Well, it's good to be back outside the house of God. <laughs> this is where God has us right now, so praise God. We know that soon these doors will open again. We serve a, a merciful and a loving God. Amen. I thank you all so much for for being with us. Sorry about that. I was getting a little wobbly. But praise God. Well, tonight we're going to be uh, starting a, a new book. I know that I, I hadn't uh, had a chance to share what book that was going to be, but uh, partially because uh, we had begun kind of a a two book series you you could say because I don't think we've gone through a first of a book and not gone into the second of a book but while we were still inside the building before uh, before everyone on this planet's life changed <laughs> we went through first Thessalonians and uh, so tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna begin second Thessalonians we're gonna briefly touch on first Thessalonians and then we'll go through uh, Chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So tonight I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. And we'll begin in chapter 4. If you remember, those who were with us on uh, the Wednesday, on the Wednesday nights so when we went through uh, First Thessalonians, uh, that Paul founded this church in Thessalonica. Uh, this was on his second uh, uh, ministry trip, if you will. Uh, it also says in Acts chapter seventeen that he was only able to spend three Sabbaths with them. So that might, that might ring a bell to a few of you. That it was just three weeks that he was able to pour into them. And then obviously having to move on because the rebellion that was chasing him. <laughs> but for the three weeks that he poured into them, the Word of God says in Acts chapter 17 that, that he reasoned with them with and from the scriptures and that's that's truly the key is as he was planning this church as he was giving them understanding uh, it's amazing that Paul was able to share with this church such depth because he gets into prophecy he starts telling them what was going to come and you always think of oh, it's a new believer you want to stay as basic as possible but the Apostle Paul sat down with them and reasoned through the Word of God. It says that he explained and demonstrated with them from the Scriptures that, that the Christ had to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. And that that Christ is Jesus. That Messiah is Jesus. So he explained those things to them. And that's Acts chapter 17. It's actually verses 2 through 5. But... But it says in verse 4 that some of them were persuaded and a great multitude joined uh, Paul and Silas. 
So we see that First Thessalonians was written to comfort the Christian. It was written to comfort the Christian by telling them that the rapture is coming and that we will be caught up with Jesus. So let's read that. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin in verse 13. The word of God says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring him for those who, slept in Je who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. See, there was a fear in the, in the, in the church at the, uh, Thessalonica that those who had already passed on, as they were learning about the risen Savior, they were thinking those who passed on were going to miss out when Jesus came back. And he was comforting them, telling them that those who were asleep, they will rise again. That they will, they will, they are not going to be forgotten. They will rise again. Even so, God will bring him with those who sleep in Jesus. Verse fifteen: For this we say to you by the word, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. Verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Praise God. Those are true words of comfort. When we start looking at the things that are before us as there was many things coming against this church, this new church. Many things were coming against them. But Paul said the encouragement, the comfort, was to come from the knowledge that we will meet him in the clouds. That's written to us as well. There will be a day, if he does not take us home before then, that we will all be taken up. This is not a fairy tale. This isn't something that's just in a book that we read about. This is the truth of the word of God. This is the whole belief that we stand in Christ, that we will meet him in the clouds, that we will be taken out. See, the word of God teaches that we're not children of wrath. And as we go into 2 Thessalonians, these things bounce off my head, <laughs> we'll see how there's references to to the coming the, the, the return of Christ so it says comfort one another with these things and in verse in chapter 5 of first Thessalonians we'll start in verse 1 it says but concerning the times and the seasons brethren you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, verse 4, I always love those, those two words. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, 
Because everything we just read, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Praise God. You know, what's, what's key about that last statement? Paul's lifting up the church because truly are truly they are a a, a solid church. They are, they are an example type church. But he tells them, comfort one another. It's not just about comforting ourselves. These words should bring us comfort. And we say, thank you, Lord, for, for giving us, for giving me this comfort. I need your comfort. I. He's saying, comfort one another. Be there and lift up and pour into one another. See, there's times where each and every one of us, we need someone by our side to lift us up. We need somebody to strengthen us. None of us can walk on our own. That's why God placed us together as a body. We're the body of Christ. We're the brethren. We need one another. As soon as we start to get isolated, we become under more attack by the enemy. But if we have brethren who love us, who are around to comfort us, to edify one another, and even as it says, as you also are doing. Praise God. That's a, that's a beautiful picture of a church. That's the picture of the church I see before me. That's the church that God has blessed us to be a part of. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as a, as a bragging. It's just the truth that God has really placed us together with people who love the Lord. That's so important. We're, we're going to get into that in chapter 5. But I just want us to bow our heads and, and pray before we start to read chapter 5. Let's close our eyes and bow our head. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time, for your word. for Father, for it is true, Lord. And we just put this evening in your hands. We thank you for this time of worship. And as we, Father, look to your word for guidance. We look to your word for strength, Lord. For understanding, for growth, Lord. We ask you by your Holy Spirit to move in the midst of your people. Father, to strengthen our hearts and draw us close to you, Lord. Father, help us to not look to the left or to the right, but to stand strong in you. Father, we also want to remember those who are afflicted, Lord. We lift up our brother Al to you, Lord, his wife, our sister Serena, our, our brother Daniel, his wife, sister Annie, Lord. Others that, Father, you know by name, Lord, the, the, the Palomino family, Lord. Father, you... You know each one, Lord, our brother Roy, our sister Pat, Father. Father, even our even our daughter Jacqueline and, and, and her husband Nathan, Lord. We put them all in your hands, Lord. Father, that we you would have your way in each life, that you would comfort and strengthen, that you would raise them up and just do your mighty will in their life. We place them before you, and we ask that, again, you continue to go before us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Praise God. You might have noticed I mentioned our worship leader. Uh, he's uh, he's with his hospital at the he's with his hospital. He's with his wife at the hospital right now. Uh, she's in labor. I forget her name. Um, no, Jacqueline. That's it, Jacqueline. My daughter. Praise God. So we know that soon God will be uh, this Bob will be sending the stork. <laughs> but praise God. So in First Thessalonians, uh, excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter one is where we're going to begin. Now Second Thessalonians was written for a different reason than First. We remember First Thessalonians being written to comfort the Christians and tell them that the rapture was coming. Second Thessalonians was written to comfort the Christian by letting them know that they're not presently in the great tribulation nor will they go through the great tribulation and to encourage them in their present in their in their present suffering and and we can look to that in the same likeness to us to to encourage us in the same manner because it's prophetic it's talking about the future so as as Paul shares this this is about a year after the first letter that was written and it was written from Corinth as he traveled he wrote back after hearing from Timothy the needs of the of the church. So he reached out to them and let's begin 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 1. 
it says Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And that's just another name for uh, Silas. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you abounds towards each other so that, oursel so that ourselves boast of you among the churches, among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest effective, uh, excuse me, manifest e evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in the day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Praise God. Praise God. Paul sees this church and it, whenever I read this, I think of, of Pastor Ray because I remember his heart and I remember when he would speak about our church, he would say, I know God sees us. I know God sees us as small, but he sees us as a priceless gem, as a little jewel. And his face would light up because he knew, he knew the love that the people of God had. And the love for one another. And this is what Paul is seeing in this church. Remember, this church was only established in such a short period of time. But it says in verse 1, to the church of the Thessalonians. You know, that's so different than most other, than most other uh, beginnings of the letters of the writing, when he's writing to the churches. It's not to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi or who are in Ephesus or who are in uh, Colossae. That's the way all those others began. But he says to the church of the Thessalonians, there's like an ownership there. He saw the pride that they had in how they, how they loved one another because that's the next thing that, that he says. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. It says we are, we are bound. We are bound or obligated is another term that can be used. We are, we are bound or obligated to thank God for you. That, that's 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 heavy when you think about that to see somebody serving God so much and as we read it says because our testimony among you was believed because you believe the words that we shared with you our testimony and what we gave to you was by the Holy Spirit and God moved in it and there was a change there was an understanding and that was given and it's it, and, and it says that that they are bound to thank God for these brethren. As it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. How does our faith grow? How did their faith grow, not just grow exceedingly? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how does our faith grow? 
spiritual growth is dependent on our study of the Bible, our knowledge of the Word of God. It says faith comes by hearing. What are we hearing? The gospel, the truth of the Word of God. As we learn and understand the Bible, as we know God more, we see truly how good He is. As we press into Him and know Him more through His Word, our faith grows. And it grows exceedingly. It'll grow faster. The more we pour in, the stronger our faith gets. The deeper our roots go. And we're able to take the things that come against us. Because if we take the Word of God lightly, and that was even talked about in Jude, if the Word of God is just something that we bring to the house of God and it goes on the back seat on the way home and it stays there until we get back to church to reach back and take it out for the next service then it's empty it's 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 like baby food because we won't grow We're, we won't even stay the same we have to receive what God has for us there has to be a hunger within us and understanding who God is brings that hunger Knowing how good he is, realizing and understanding what he's done for us, causes us to truly grow closer to him. And as it says, it's also fitting. It says fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you, of every one of you all abounds towards each other. And, and when I see this, I can't help but but think of how blessed we truly are. Those those who are here can look around and know that the people round about you are there in anything you need. And you can't say that about every church. You can't say that in different places where you go. God established us and 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 I'm not again lifting our body up. Paul is saying this about the, the Thessalonians and their church because he sees these traits in them. But God has blessed us with these same traits. Those who have come, who have grown up in the house of God, those who have been strengthened, have felt that love of God. How many times has each one of us heard somebody share with them when they came to visit for the first time, wow, you have a very loving church. People came up to me. Well, now they can't. People stood far away from me. and <laughs> It kind of loses its. <laughs> but it would always be, ask me how I was doing and, and welcomed me and made me feel at home. And there's brethren here that have been here for years and years and years. But when they first came, that's what they felt. That's what I felt. God has given us the blessing to show that love. And we really have to appreciate it because it can be easy to take it for granted and just think, ah, oh, that's, yeah, that, you know, I know, but, and, and start to find other things to complain about. When God has blessed us with brethren round about us that at a drop of a hat, they will show that love. They will be there for you. And we've seen it over and over. And, and that just encourages my heart so much because it is, it is a, uh, it is a proof of a true understanding of the love of God. Because that's not natural. It's okay. It, it, it may be more natural to do it with your family. To do it with those you're related to. But to those that God has brought together. You know there was a time where none of us knew each other. Well not some of you are families. So I guess you've always known each other. But our families didn't know each other. There was a time where I came just to visit. Sit in the back row, the sizzler, and watch the SWAT team come. Those of you who know that, I'm not going to go into that, but those of you who know, know what I'm talking about. But God has brought us together. And it says in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So it says Paul is boasting on them. 
yeah, maybe I'm boasting on you a little bit tonight. Because God has blessed me tremendously by each and every one of you. By those who aren't even here tonight that have been such a, a valuable part. By those who, who were raised up here that know that the moment they walk back into this church, that they'll receive nothing but a hug and love. Welcome home. Because that's the heart that God has given us as a church. And that all just reflects on our Savior. Amen? Let's continue. Verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. See, so Paul was telling you the churches all about him. But what was he telling them? It says, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Wait a minute. He was boasting on them in, in all your persecutions, tribulations that you endure. Well, wait a minute. He just said that that they were a strong church, that they were growing in faith exceedingly. They're doing all the right things. Why is there persecution? That's not right. I heard a guy on TV say that if God loves you, he's going to give you all kinds of money and bless you with all these things. But how does that stack up against the true church? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Wait a minute, that wasn't on the brochure when I came in. <laughs> Welcome to the Rock Church, and we love you, and we're glad you're here, and you're going to suffer persecution. <laughs> that's, that's not part of it. Well, the Word of God says that the true church is going to suffer persecution. It's talking about this church doing so well, and it's persecution that it's going through, and tribulation, that brought patience and faith. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though something strange happened. Does that mean as believers, our life is hopeless? Of course not. Because even as, as these things are coming against the church, as these things are, are talked about as to the believers, it says in Romans 8, verse 18, and I'm sorry that I'm bouncing so quickly because I'm trying to move a little fast. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Praise God. It doesn't compare to what we have before us. These things that we go through, now, each circumstance is different, but what I'm speaking to is the church. I'm speaking to the believer. I'm speaking to those who are, are pressing in and going forward. There's still going to be those things, but it is not. It is not an attack of God. It's an attack of man. It's an attack of the things that are coming against us. God is not trying to to scold us or to spank us to where we say, God, why are you doing these things to me? Why am I going through this? How many times did we see the Apostle Paul go through so many things and it was only to bless others as he went through it to open the eyes of others for their understanding to grow? Let's go back to verse 5. The end of verse 4 said, In all persecutions and tribulations, and in all, in all your persecution and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Praise God. It, it's unusual because that's not our normal thought. We say if we're suffering, something's wrong. If we're going through something, there has to be a problem. 
And God is saying in this life as we go through things, it's only evidence as we keep going. Because it says they endured. It didn't say they gave up. It didn't say that. It says their faith was strengthened exceedingly. It says they went forward and they endured. And what does that do? That's showing the proof and the righteousness of God. We, we can't think that God is angry because of a circumstance that we go through. It, it, it's not wrong to question what we go through because some of us have gone through some circumstances that, that, that are not easy. And some are in the midst of them even right now. But we know that we can trust in the mercy and grace of our God. He is a loving God. In verse 6, it talks about, Since it is a righteous thing for God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. See, now it's starting to go into the prophecy of the return of Christ. Because one of the things that, that we find today that the world likes to try to throw at the Christian is they like to say, how could a loving God allow judgment? How can a loving God send someone and condemn them, send them to hell? How is that possible if he's supposed to be loving? See, they're asking that question out of context. They've already, they've already erred in the way they asked it because they're already assuming things that aren't true. You, you look, at, look at it as a picture here. You're, you're driving down the road. You come to a fork in the road. The fork in the road has two ways you can travel. One says danger, bridge out, destruction ahead. The other one says enter, enter by the narrow way. As we each stand at that fork in the road, if we choose to go down the road of destruction, and it is exactly what it claims it is. Who is to blame? The maker of that road? Is it their fault that we went down that path? The creator of that road? Or if that bridge is out, the creator who, who made that bridge, is it his fault? We blame him because he's not merciful? No, we stand, each one of us, and each one will stand before God and have to, be, have to give an account for the choices we've made in this life. And the Word of God says that every, every word and thought will go before us without Jesus Christ. But if we choose the narrow road, if we choose the path that is good, it says that those things will be washed away. So we're not saying God is not merciful. We can't blame God for everything. They say, well, that's, that's not right. He's judging. He is the judge, the righteous judge. Because what, what if we were a, a judge in a courtroom? And they said, well, this guy uh, who's standing before you is a, is a serial killer. And he, and he kills, he, he's killed so many different people constantly. And he's already claimed that he's going to get out and kill more. Well, you should have mercy on him. A good judge would just let him go. Well, how would he explain that? How would that good judge explain that to those who he went out and killed afterward? And we know that's happened in our society. But if our God does not stand by his word in justice, then he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because he gives us a road. But he loves us so much that he sent his son to die on a cross, to pay the cost that we receive freely 
and that we can enter heaven. And all we have to do is agree to receive it. And if I don't agree to that, then, then you're judging me. See, they're, they're flipping the tables around. They want to blame everyone else for, for their own actions. See, God is just. God is merciful. And he loves us so much that he left heaven and wrapped himself in flesh and died in our place. That's what we have to keep in mind. When others try to say, well, then how come so much darkness has come into this world? Because the further the way the world gets from God, the darker the heart of man gets. It's not God that's allowing that. It's the man that's running away from God. And God gives us a free will. If we didn't have a free will, then we would be robots and we would all just stand in line and go to heaven. God wants us to love him. We can't love him if we have no choice. But there's some that don't want to. There's some that want darkness. And there will be judgment. And that's truly what, what Paul is trying to, to make mention, that there is a just God who will bring this tribulation. And this is going to come to pass. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. This will happen. And we as believers have to remember that. We have to be encouraged by it. But we also have to remember that we are limited on time to reach out to the lost. See this as a provoking. Look at the day we live in. We know the Word of God talks about a, a, a one world currency, about a one world religion. You, you go through the drive through and they say, oh, we don't have any, any change. And, we don't, and everyone starts going, oh, no. No one would have ever thought anything could become a one world anything because we're so separate. And then all of a sudden this pandemic hits. And all of a sudden everything is worldwide. And people are starting to talk in different manners. See, the Bible is not wrong. The Bible has given us the truth. We just have to know it and be ready and walk forward in it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off the track here. Let's go back to where we were at. And this gives some, some direction here. Let's go back to verse 7. It says, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. See, that's truly what perdition is, complete separation from God. Everything good comes from above, comes from God. Complete separation from that. Verse 10, when he comes in that day to be glorified in, in his saints and to be admired along with all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Praise God. We have to look back sometimes to, to understand what's before us. We can look back to even Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham told God uh, in uh, chapter 18. He said, God, would you condemn the righteous with the unrighteous? The godly with the ungodly? What if there is 50 what is there's 50 people that are righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you spare them? Then he went to 45. Then he went to 40. Then he went to 30 and 20 and 10. But what happens in the next chapter? Lot was the only one coming out with his family. And it even says he went to his son-in-laws and told them, warned them to leave with him now that destruction was coming. And they laughed and said he was joking. They thought he was joking. They didn't take him serious. That's a picture of what the world is doing now. Laughing at the things of God. Not taking it serious. Mocking the things of God. Thinking that we can make things whatever way we want. As long as we're the gospel of being nice. See, there's nothing wrong with showing love and being nice. 
But when it's talking about the Word of God and it's contrary completely and fully to the Word of God, we can't just be nice. We have to tell someone what they're saying and doing will send them to the pit. That's the most loving thing we can do. The most loving thing we can do is give them the truth. But it must be done in the love of God. It must be done with meekness. Don't, don't get me wrong. We don't beat people in the head with our Bible. But if we can sit back and watch someone in the midst of sin and, and be a part of those things and act like it's not even there and it doesn't even bother us in the slightest, who truly are we hurting? That's selfishness because all we're concerned is ourselves, and we might not want to get involved in that conversation. But what happens a week later when that person's gone? You're standing at a funeral service thinking, I had an opportunity. That's how real life is. We don't know what stands before us. And I don't say these things to try to bring fear or to, to try to shake you in any way. I say this in the love of God. We are blessed to have one another. We're blessed that God goes before us. We're blessed that the love of God dwells in the midst of us and that we are growing stronger in his faith. But we need to apply it to those outside this fence, to those outside of our circles, outside of our Christian life. Because if that's what we're contained in, all we're doing is enjoying what we have. And we're not showing compassion and love for this lost world. And we'll finish with the last two verses. Verse 11. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the works of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified with you and you in him according to the grace of our Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. He wants us to glorify him. First Thessalonians tells us we're going to meet him in the clouds. Everything that needs to have happened, all the prophecies that had to come to pass before this happened, have happened. We don't know the day. But we must be ready. And we want to glorify God in all we do. We want to be, we want to be, what does the word say? We want to be worthy of this calling. Amen? God has given us opportunity to be worthy of his calling. I'm going to call the musicians forward at this time. And even as tonight, this, this word just kind of causes us to look to the future. Because it talks about Jesus coming back with the saints. It talks about him coming back with the saints on white horses. I don't know how many of you can ride horses, but we're going to learn real fast, aren't we? <laughs> this is going to be a time of rejoicing when he calls us to meet him in the clouds. But we must be ready as we stand here because that judgment will come. These words are not man's words. This word is the word of God. And we must truly take it to heart and grow in it as he gives us this word. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand. And as always, we want to give an opportunity that anyone wants prayer. So if there's anyone that, that, that wants to pray, that, that needs prayer tonight, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, after I pray to step out here to this line and some of the leaders will come and pray with you. But right now I'm going to ask you to, to bow your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for this true Lord. Father, we thank you for the blessing that you've given us to, to dwell, Father, even with one another. Father, I feel so blessed to be a part of this body. Father, I know there is many churches that are, that are good, strong churches and that it's a blessing to be a part of, but I'm so thankful that you've placed me here, that you've placed me with my brother. And I ask you to continue to stoke that fire of revival in our hearts. Continue to fill us with the love, Lord, one for another, 
Father, that they would know that we are your children. And Father, continue to keep our mind and heart set upon you, that our faith would go strong. Father, help keep us in our word, Lord. Father, help us to be mindful of those around about us. There are so many that are suffering, Lord. So many that are hurting and broken that don't know you, Lord. We have the words of life, Lord. Open our mouths to be used as tools in your hand, Lord. Help us to clearly see, Lord, the needs that stand right before our eyes. Give us your eyes, Lord. We thank you for this time, Father. And if there's anyone that needs prayer, Lord, you cause them even to come forward and to receive a touch from you. We just give you all thanks, all honor, and all praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. If there's anyone that desires prayer, you can step out forward and praise God and we'll pray for you. If not, we can worship God where we stand. Life is easy.
declare that Lord you are God Lord wherever we are and um, Lord like we heard tonight Lord we try to comfort ourselves Lord but help us as your children Lord to really look tonight tomorrow and the days to come the rest of this week to comfort other people around us Lord to be comforters Lord to comfort them Lord with your word with truth with your love God Help us, Lord God, to think of others, Lord, to be encouraged to know, God, that in the valley and on the mountains, you are God. In these circumstances, you're, gonna, you're using them to make us your, who you want us to be, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength just to love you and serve you and bless everyone that came tonight, everyone watching online. May you hear all the prayers that were prayed tonight. Bless Pastor Mike, his family, uh, Sister Jackie and Nathan, the baby. And we just pray together tonight. All God's people, in Jesus' name, say, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>